Ah, nice and easy. Okay. Um, I will tell you about, about a piece of my research program. It's one piece of what I've been doing for about the last 20 years or so. Um, it's one piece of this broader puzzle as well. It's a little bit kind of a, a finer focus um, than some of the talks you've seen. I have a lot of slides. They're not very entertaining. They're kind of focused. Um, but I, I, it's a, a good chance to tell you about some of the data. And I'm, I'm very much interested in what resilience is. And for about 20 years now, I've been trying to understand that from a measurement point of view, because I think we can make people more resilient. And that's, of course, one thing that a lot of people talk about, one thing we all want to do. But I, I really focus on trying to define what it is that we're trying to achieve by doing that. Um, so I also um, have a lot of common sense in my talk. And I get a lot of credit for these ideas now. They, they were kind of uh, radical or uh, blasphemous once, and now I get credit for them. Either way, I'm a little bit embarrassed by both of those polls, because it's really just common sense. Um, with a lot of data, but common sense. So we know some things. That bad things happen is, a, is about as much common sense as you could have. Um, we know that during the course of a normal lifespan, most of us, everybody in fact, will, will lose loved ones. And we have to deal with it. As we get older, that becomes more a part of our life. We know that most people are exposed to violent and life-threatening events many times during the course of their life. That's kind of a a secret that we somehow keep telling ourselves, or, or a, a bit of a kind of a, a myth that that doesn't happen, but they, especially because we think of these things as really horrible events, but they happen to most of us. And they can be d distressing and debilitating. So you turn on the television, get online, look at a newspaper, look at a newspaper online, you'll see these kinds of images every day. And these are, they're, ri they're riveting images. And the field, the mental health field where I live, uh, the academic world, has focused really on this kind of trauma, and PTSD, on, on the trauma reaction. And it, it should be that way, because these are important reactions. And when people are traumatized, they need help. But it's kind of almost become really, it's become myopic to where we're not looking at the fuller picture. And I'd like to argue with, for you today that we really need to understand the full picture if we're going to understand these events. So I call this the limits of diagnoses and the problem of averages. The, if, if we look at the focus on the extremes in psychopathology, we know certain things. We know 10, 10 to 15 percent, I'm sorry, 10 to 65 percent show chronic grief and depression when there's been a loss. We know that people show post-traumatic stress disorder. If you look at those percentages, though, these come from the literature, from the published studies. And you can see how wide-ranging these disorders are reported in the literature. And you know already something's wrong here. Um, one of the things is that we focus on psychopathology, we do something called sampling bias. From a research perspective, sampling bias simply means that if we're talking about trauma, we're only going to see a certain part of the population. Because people are healthy, actually, if you try to get them into a trauma study, they'll tell you, oh, you don't want me because I'm fine. And that's kind of the assumption is that these events are, the events are bad, they cause trauma. And if you are not traumatized, the researchers aren't even interested in you. That's called sampling bias in a nutshell. Dramatic oversimplification. But sampling bias is absolutely rampant in psychology and the mental health types of research, psychiatry. There's questions about di diagnostic cutoff. We, we believe the myth that diagnoses are in nature. And that's, a, that's quite a myth. And we change them all the time. But when we change them all the time, we also change how much trauma, how much ADHD, how much any of those things we have. And most important, um, it's uninformed about the underlying distribution. And this is really the point I'm most interested in. If we have a potentially traumatic event and a continuation of time, and then a continuation of functioning, this would be, say, disruptions in normal functioning or psychopathology. Chronic psychopathology, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, look like this. So there's variations in these levels of adjustment over time. But then everybody else is simply put into this other category of non-psychopathology. And you think to yourself, well, where are we on this graph? Where is everybody else? And this is all we know, that everybody else, which is, say, 90, 95% of the people exposed to these violent and life-threatening events, where are they? What's their experience? What kind of variations? And we don't know. We haven't known until recently. Because psychopathology is so dramatic, trauma is so dramatic, we've assumed they must be up there near the top somewhere. But we haven't known. The other way we can look at it is to look at the average. And you hear about averages every day when you read in a paper that coffee is good for you, or coffee is not good for you, chocolate's good for you, coffee and chocolate is really good for you, or beer is good for you now, white beer is really good for you now, especially after you work out. 
This is what averages tell us. And um, I'll, I'll try to show you that it's, it's a little misleading, especially. Um, um, so averages look like this after potentially traumatic events. That's about what you see. But they still don't tell us about everybody else. So averages are uninformative about the underlying distribution. But they're even potentially more uh, dangerous in a way because they're also potentially misleading. Because we often assume that the average is the normative response, the most common response, statistically the mode. And it's often not the case. This is a silly example. This is my daughter in, when she was in fourth grade. She hates this picture. Um, but if we measure their height, um, it's about like that. And height is fairly, uh, it's a safe bet in fourth grade because um, they're all about the same height. There's some variation, the munchkins are at that point. You know, there isn't too much variation. And that's actually not their teachers, what you get when you Google teacher. Um, but you, you, you Google teacher and you get that. And you, you take the height of the teacher. And the teacher's clearly taller. That's not a problem either. But say, in the New York public school, we do all kinds of interesting things. So the Knicks come, the New York Knicks, the basketball team, to do a seminar on how to lose graciously. Um, and um, couldn't help but throw that in. Um, but these, these guys are very tall, right? So now we have a much different distribution. We take the average height, and we find that the teacher is the average height, even though there's only one teacher. And this is a silly example, but these are actually kind of the distributions you see after potentially traumatic life events. So if we only know this, we know about psychopathology, we know about the average, and we assume, well, average is probably most people, and psychopathology is really bad, and we we're drawn to that. So probably there are not many people down there, down in this zone of mild to not much of a reaction at all. And until recently, we just haven't known who's, who's there. We've assumed not many people would be there on the graph. And if people are down there, they're either incredibly healthy, that's one of the myths, one of the false myths, that people who are showing that kind of response are incredibly healthy and unusual, or there's something wrong with them. So say somebody's <coughs> been through a disaster, they've been raped, they've been in an assault, they've been uh, 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 in a terrorist attack, and they look like that. Are they healthy or dysfunctional? And those have been the two extremes that we've worked with. Children in refugee camps, healthy or dysfunctional, one or the other, extremely healthy or dysfunctional. So about 20 years ago, we began a research program um, trying to map the different patterns of outcome. And um, we did this very crudely at first because we didn't have better methods. But if you go back to this graph and we put in the results of that uh, work, it looks something like that. Um, chronicity is around 30%, and that's the highest it gets. Usually it's around 5 to 10%. That, by chronicity, I mean long-lasting mental health problems after highly aversive events. But you'll notice the most common response is down there in that spot where we weren't sure about. That's what I'm calling here resilience. You can call this anything. Call this a stable trajectory of healthy functioning. The, the word resilience is not really necessary because this is really an empirical finding. This is what we find across many different studies. I'll show you some of those studies. Uh, it's usually, I'm sorry, about 50% or more. It's usually the most common response. Um, it is al almost always the most common response, and it's usually the majority response across all kinds of life events. Um, a couple of years ago, we started doing something much more sophisticated. I'll only tell you about this for a few minutes. Um, we started determining the trajectories empirically using something called latent class, latent class growth, analysis, growth analysis and latent growth mixture modeling. Um, I've just decided, um, forgive this, but I'm going to skip all this because I think it's too uh, detailed. Well, you can see it happening as I'm going by because this is going really slowly. Um, but this is, well, this is a good one. We take what, what, what was assumed to be a normal distribution, which is everybody loves a normal distribution. Students tell you the data are normal. It's great. They're not normal, usually, especially after potentially traumatic events. They're skewed like that. And latent growth mixture modeling finds the populations hidden within, those, within that assumed heterogeneous curve. So we're actually finding the different groups of people that are embedded in there. We're finding them statistically. And they move across time, so the distribution changes across time. But we can model all of this stuff. The reason we can do it now, I'm going to skip this one. The reason we can do it now is because we have better computing power. And the normal people like me in my lab, we have better computing power. This is the German panel data set. This is a data set the German government collects every year. It's a nationally rep representative sample of Germans. German households. This particular sample was followed for 19 years or 17,000 people. They make the data publicly available. 
This was published in the Economic Journal. Andrew Clark, who's an economist at the Paris School of Economics, and Ed Diener, who's a social psychologist in Illinois, did this analysis. And they were interested in, um, in these 17,000 people, how life satisfaction changed across these different kinds of events. And this is based on averages. So they first looked at widowhood, and this looks about right. There's a, life satisfaction tends to drop the year before the spouse dies, probably because of illness. And then it um, hits its low points during the, the year of the bereavement, and then it goes back up. When we did this, reanalyze these same data with Andrew Clark, actually, using latent growth mixture modeling, we found four different groups, four different populations, essentially. And about 21% of the people showed that pattern. That 21% showed that drop, and then a return, although they didn't get back to baseline. But 58.5% showed essentially no change, slight dip the year of their spouse died. This is um, one of my favorite examples. This is divorce. Um, this is the average. If you go by the average published in the Economic Journal and you're married, what does this tell you? <laughs> you have to wait, you get divorced, then you wait a year or two, and then your, 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 uh, your life satisfaction will increase. So when we reanalyze these data using the mixture modeling, we found that 9% of the sample showed this pattern. 19% showed uh, the, a decrease in their life satisfaction. And these are the groups that you hear about. But 71.8% showed high stable life satisfaction throughout the study. And that's very high. I think that was unexpected for, to everyone involved in the study. By the way, I should point out that the mixture modeling type of analyses, essentially they give us the best fitting picture. That's what this is that you're seeing. This is marriage. Um, there's a lot of interest. <laughs> I didn't even have to say anything. The world is preoccupied with the question of who can be married and who can't, to, a, to the point of obsession and lots of pain and lots of nasty things being said. It's not even worth it, um, basically. Um, you get about a year out of being married, and then that's it. You're back where you started from. Um, anyway, so we, we um, analyze it with mixture modeling, and we find that 80% of the population is about the same before and after they get married. High life satisfaction. Now, this was the study that actually got me interested in the more complex modeling. This is a common finding in the parenthood literature. Um, that, and this is a, the published data set from the German panel study, a published finding from the German panel data set. The year of the first child life satisfaction goes up. Stays up for one year, and then it goes down, and it never returns to baseline. Um, and this is a widely accepted finding as, as reality. Um, we reanalyze this data, and you can already guess what I'm going to show you. 7.2% uh, of the people in this study, this is the Germany again, had a decrease in life satisfaction uh, after children. 4% were doing poorly the entire time. 4% um, no, I'm sorry, showed a slight increase, but the vast majority of people were about the same before and after. Now, I'm interested in potentially traumatic events. That's not why I'm talking about having children. Um, but we do things like this normally. Um, this is a study of traumatic injury. This is scary stuff. This is 330 people in the US had a single incident traumatic injury, had to be taken to a level one trauma center and required immediate surgery. This is very scary. So there's somebody minding their own business. Something happens, there are ambulances and, and physical pain and then surgery. We measured post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms and depression uh, in hospital, and then one, three, six months later. And we found 21% showed this increasing uh, PTSD response. So this essentially would qualify as PTSD, although it's not a diagnosis. Um, so elevated post-traumatic stress throughout the, the time of the study. But 60, almost 61% showed no symptoms at all. So even though you have these two extremes, you have a lot of one in five people showing post-traumatic stress disorder. You still have lots of people who are not showing any, rea any trauma reaction at all, and then a couple of other patterns. Um, what about children? Well, children, it must be worse. About the exact same finding for children. This is an Australian study from uh, Robin LeBrock and uh, Paul Canardi, 57% resilience. Um, oh, I'm going to, well, this is breast cancer surgery. I wasn't going to show this. Um, um, but we have 15% chronic distress and 66% resilience. This is a study we did in Hong Kong. Um, this was a study we just completed, which I was kind of uh, excited about, if in a kind of draconian way, sorry, um, that 233 spinal cord injury patients from six European countries. Spinal cord injury is rare, so this is a pretty big sample. Um, and we analyzed, oh, sorry, I went too fast. 
Uh, we analyzed um, their data at the time of the hospitalization and over the next two years. Again, the same finding. 52% uh, showed no depression. 58% showed no anxiety at any point in the study, even though there's lots of pathology, too. Um, and the big question, as you can tell, that's emerging for, from this is why are people sp split up in these dramatic ways. One more study, this is the um, psychological cost of war, and this is very hard to measure, and I'm very interested in this now. Um, military studies are typically based on convenience samples, whoever they can get. They're sampling bias like crazy. Um, they're cross-sectional, sometimes longitudinal. People in the military know that what they say is not 100% confidential for obvious reasons. That's how wars are fought. You need to know. Somebody needs to know what people are saying. In the year 2000, though, the Department of Defense commissioned the Millennium Cohort Study, and Tyler Smith's group in, uh, Los, in San Diego did this. And they had a huge sample, 77,000. Um, they are targeting 140,000. The goal is to follow them for 21 years. Um, soon after the study began, 9-11 happened, and then two wars, so, the, so a lot of these soldiers, 30% of this first panel, were deployed. And um, these data were, the, were confidential and anonymous. This is the first time that really ever happened. So this is the best data set ever collected on a military <coughs> sample. There's a lot of press about what are the costs of war, how much trauma, how resilient are soldiers? Should we try to make them more resilient? Let's spend a lot of money and make them more resilient. In the United States, we just spent $131 million on a resilience building program with the Army. So th we did the mixture modeling analysis. I was fortunate to collaborate them. And what we found was 6.7% developed chronic, chronically elevated post-traumatic stress disorder. That's much lower than any other studies ever reported. This is the best data set, I'm, I'm arguing. There was one other study that was prospective and found something kind of similar to this. 2.2% showed chronically elevated post-traumatic stress even before they went to war. That's not surprising, but we can remove that group. And then 83% showed essentially no trauma reactions at all. That's a lot. The military are well-trained, and that's a lot. And that's, there's a lesson in here. Um, I think most of us are naive about the military. And I think there's an important lesson here about why people can go through this very, very, very difficult kind of deployment and come out looking so well. And there's a, there's a lot to learn from that. Um, we then said, well, what about multiple, multiple deployers? And we hear so many stories about people who've gone to war many times. Well, surprisingly, the data were even healthier looking. Only 4.5% showed chronic PTSD and we had also this group who was not doing well at any point. Uh, and then the resilience level went up a little higher. Um, this slide just summarizes a lot of the different studies. And I've just put the two trajectories of resilient and the chronic without bothering with the other ones. And you can see across all these studies, terrorist attacks, bereavement studies, we've done a lot of different things, SARS, um, hereditary cancer testing, some of the things I've already told you about. That resilience is always a resilient pattern of essentially not having a uh, a, a, a noticeable mental health reaction, and in some of the studies, it's a um, we we measure positive aspects of adjustment. Sometimes we have their friends tell us how they're doing. Across all those studies, most people are essentially doing really well, and if it's not the majority, it's the most common response. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is that very simply, that there are multiple unique predictors of resilient outcomes. There isn't one thing that predicts resilience. There isn't two things. It's not necessarily in us. There's a lot of interest in um, whether we are resilient or not as people. That's a piece of it, but it's probably less than, it's probably 10 or 15% of the variability. You know, if you have a Venn diagram, it's probably a, a pretty small slice of the pie. Lots of other things that come into play. Resources, resources are very big. Um, your history, your stress levels, all those things come into play, uh, and they, they are, constantly changing. They're very difficult to kind of get a, a beat on. They're, they're not necessarily things we can change easily. They're, and I think some of the other talks echoed this earlier, that there's some big things that need to be changed that really about just how we treat each other and how we live in the world that are going to have an impact. And this, these data really suggest that same point. So um, I think I can stop there. I have 21 seconds left. But. <laughs>